Uh, and then when it comes to code analysis, again, here we're, we're trying to take it all the way back to source, all the way back to assembly, uh, maybe even object code if possible. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, you can see I've written a little formula up there. You know, as we get further and further down the fun slide, um, you know, the complexity really does go up. Usually adversaries do put a good bit of effort in trying to resist that deep level of analysis. And uh, as you get closer and closer to code analysis, again, usually their uh, methods, if you will, of armoring techniques end up becoming more and more advanced. And so uh, you know, we try to have a lot of your wins with static analysis before transcending these later areas. Also, you need to have a consideration you know, when it comes to like your peers or even your own time. It does take more skill, in my opinion, as you transcend into later uh, steps uh, in this method. So, starting off with our Golang malware, again, this is Brosi. Know that I've learned this name through reading, not because I've talked to people about it, so I'm sure there's a proper pronunciation. Unfortunately, there's not a book on phonics for uh, researchers. Uh, with that being said, uh, it's a Golang-based malware, so I'll be able to demonstrate that to you, uh, how it is I know it's Golang-based. Um, you'll notice I didn't so much, uh, later on you'll see I don't so much fill out the dynamic or code analysis portions, just because again, if this group wants to invite me back, I'll show now transcending into the dynamic analysis on all these different samples that I'm presenting today. Maybe I'll do different samples again, hopefully it'll invite you back. Uh, but focus on static analysis, you can see the tools, I list them out that I'm actually going to be using. And again, my style of presentation is I'm more into uh, a demonstration kind of style where I show the, the mechanics of going through the work. Though what you're not going to see today is, again, if you were some in the business of doing this professionally, the expectation is usually that you roll it up in some kind of reporting or indicators of compromise or something that goes out in distribution. That's not what I'm showing today. I'm just showing the mechanics of getting the information that they use. Um, so here's our first tool. Uh, again, I know you're all going to remember this tool list. Um, but from a tool perspective, we're getting into PE Studio. PE Studio, uh, I just I can't say enough good things about this tool. The free version of it is so powerful, and everything you're going to see is me using the free version of it. It's a really cheap tool. Again, if you're in the business of analyzing malware, you probably want this in a toolkit. Also, all toolkits that I use are based on uh, Rumnux. OA Labs, which again, they have an installer for Windows, maybe even free Windows distros, we don't know about it, I'll tell you about my blog after the presentation, I've got a lot of good material there, how you set up your analysis lab, um, also FireEye uh, Flare um, is also another great um, setup, if you will, that is more Windows focused and allows you to analyze malware, so PE Studio is a part of all three of those last I checked. Uh, again, on the screen, I kind of do one, two, three, four, five, and I'll try to do this as often as possible as I'm doing the demonstration, but kind of talking from top to bottom. What we're starting off at, if you look at, this is going to be to your left, you can see I kind of have the root node selected within this application, and it really gives us some important data that we can use to find out a lot of facts about the sample we have. More times than not, you know, uh, a lot of the samples you may come across usually aren't all is specific to you. And so, um, again, the information displayed in front of you allows you to, uh, using these uh, uh, data points, if you will, will allow you to discover what's out in the public domain. So, again, talk speaking from item one. You see item one, I'm just kind of pointing to the different hashes, um, you know, by selecting uh, some of the, the uh, bigger hashing algorithms like SHA-256. Um, you could argue that there's a bit of accuracy, and if you have the MD5 the malware, you could probably just do some quick searches and probably find a lot of good information. Kind of going down to two, two shows you um, some of the initial header information. You can probably see this with the text editor as well. Uh, what I find useful about that is that you kind of peek, and uh, sometimes uh, there's a lot of presentations out there on how to abuse the Cortex tool for that. And so I like to sometimes just kind of glance, see what the hex looks like, see what the uh, ASCII looks like when it's decoded, and sometimes you see interesting things. For the most part, what we see here, it has MZ at the header, clearly it's portable executable. Uh, moving along, uh, we also get an entropy value. Entropy is really interesting to us because uh, you know, as we get closer to the value of eight, that means there is more randomness in the data that's within the file. Uh, and so there's you know, if we think from a byte perspective, there's usually a pretty set threshold um, as far as uh, you know how many ones and zeros we have, especially if we roll it up to the 
tax level. And so we have a lot of distribution, if you will, as far as uh, of zeros, ones, two, three, all the way up to Fs. And again, that's indicative of high entropy. Uh, and normally what that leads us to as analysts is for us to go, oh, high entropy, there's probably something extra happening. It's impressive, it's encrypted, who knows, but we're going to have that adventure now, right? We can find it out. Uh, the next item that it shows you is, is the, uh, the impash. Uh, impash is an interesting uh, thing for analysts because with impash, um, again, that's just a hash of the import section of the file. Imports, uh, when you think about a portal executable, that is effectively uh, all the APIs that we're going to be using for the underlying operating system. Uh, it's going to give us a good clue about those and specifically which function calls out of those APIs are in use. And what you'll find is you do more of this or even just your own private research on uh, imports as it relates to malware is that, especially when it comes to obfuscated malware, it's usually kind of the same three, four, five function calls that are typically in play that, again, would probably allow you kind of like entropy to include, include. there's probably something extra packed in here. And again, uh, impash is searchable in a lot of the uh, malware repositories. Uh, and so, in theory, uh, by using impash, you can potentially find um, similar mal code as the sample that you're looking at. And so, sometimes there's a point you reach where, yeah, maybe you put a little bit of energy into the one sample you have, but then you want the breadth of samples. So, uh, let's say you're in the business of building signatures from a network or a host perspective. Now, the volume can count for a lot once you have a handle on a single sample. Uh, moving along, uh, we also have some other information. Again, file type executable. So it's not a library. That's all that tells us. You can also see that it's 32-bit code. Um, that's really nice. Um, if you guys haven't taken the time to learn assembly at this point, uh, you know, 32-bit assembly, in my opinion, is uh, very easy to read. It's very easy to pick up. Uh, probably do it the weekend. Um, and so now, look, I'm just going down the tree, right? So I was originally in the root node, you know, looking at the screen, I'll just move down to the next item. And what we're seeing on the screen is, again, in my opinion, what the value is of this individual tool, again, in powers and the analyst. It's showing what it believes are indicators, and it gives you a pretty descriptive statement on why it believes those are indicators. So if we look at two, uh, you know, it's what it's pointing to, that was covered up on my arrow, is that in virus a lot of the 73 malware scan engines. Now, we have not submitted this sample. We're going to check the hash. So that's all the tools do. So you're not blowing your cover. You have the sample, right? You're worried about offset. But get this result back that this malware has been seen before, and a number of vendors feel that it's bad. Okay? And that, that immediately may be your reason to go, oh, you know what? I'm just that much more motivated to look at the sample. It might be a good one. Um, and then on the severity side, uh, again, as we get closer to the volume one, uh, that's indicative of criticality. And so having this piece of information, again, half the malware vendors think this one's bad, it's probably a good reason for you to go, not like that. Um, kind of uh, going down the list, uh, we also have some other uh, cool references. Uh, for instance, uh, in there, uh, two points at, there's two, two references to blacklisted libraries. And so uh, one of the things that's interesting is, uh, you know, from an industry perspective, uh, you, know, I, you know, I mentioned it earlier when it comes to OS uh, API calls, there's typically kind of the standard set of libraries that you invoke and kind of the standard set of functions you might invoke. And so at this point for this, this particular group of people who make this tool, they've broken that down into a blacklist. Um, again, uh, moving through, they also show um, the sections within the file. So if you didn't know, uh, with portal executables, uh, typically, they're broken down into uh, sections, and those sections they have things like your data. There's going to be a portion that has the code. Uh, there's going to be a portion that may have other resources you may pull upon. And anyways, all this is highlighting for you is hey, these three main sections are a little suspicious. Also, bonus right off the bat, the name of the sections is UPX. Okay? If you were to Google UPX, you're quickly going to get hits, and you're going to get indications that there's probably a packer in play. Um, kind of moving down the list, uh, my apologies here for the visibility. Um, moving down the list, uh, we can see some references, some other areas. Uh, one that's really interesting uh, on four uh, is a reference to the entry point being outside of the first section. And so really what that means is, is that 
Um, normally it's expected that in the first section, that's usually your .txt is typically the name of that section, that's usually where code applies. Well, within the metadata of the file, it has to tell, you have to tell the computer where to start, and that's the entry point. And so this entry point is not pointing at that first entry. Here's the bottom line. If you didn't know anything about malware analysis, what's powerful right now is that we haven't executed the tool. Here it is, we have a piece of software that is highlighting all the things that should make you extra interested in looking at this example. Uh, just to kind of bring this part to a close, uh, there's a false code entry in there. This file contains self-modifying code. That's kind of interesting. Um, you can probably uh, you know, take the output uh, from this product and add up all the ones and say, hey, you know what? There's, you know, in this case, maybe 15, 20 security one items listed. Again, that might be a good reason to right off the bat go, these are interesting samples. You can maybe push them along in your process if you're going to industrialize this to focus on those specific so here's the result from virus tool. Again, we're just going down the tree. It's so easy. When we uh, look at the results, here's really what you want to key in. One, how many days has the vendor been detecting that particular sample as the name signature that fired? The name signature that fired is the stuff in red. Again, the vendor is to the your left. Um, what's what I see that's common is we see all the references to uh, zebra C, and so. Since we see all the references to Zebra C, uh, we could probably quickly say this might be Zebra C, which now gives you a key term to go out there in the interwebs. Now, um, the reason why this is important is with signatures, a lot of times you'll get gen.groj.1. What that really means is that your vendor has gotten into the business of heuristics and can just auto categorize it. Clearly, this is a Trojan. When it's this specific or something named, that means it's probably pretty interesting. Use the analyst should probably get really curious at that point and go, well, why would a vendor take the time, given all the malware in the world, to name this one? Okay. Again, if you go look, it's associated with one of those bears, fancy bear, dancing bear, I can't remember which one. Um, but please Google it afterwards. Um, we're not here to do an intelligence presentation, fortunately, or else I get into that. Um, also, the authentic hash is kind of cool. So somebody decided to sign this code. So again, if you did have access to a large repo of malcode, let's say this particular malcode is being used within your environment, you could use the authentic code to maybe go back and go check and see what other samples may have similar authentic code. Uh, some of the other information that's available, um, and again, this is off the virus total, in case you guys don't know where I'm sitting at right now, uh, is that virus total also uh, displays the impact. I mentioned earlier that's something that's searchable. Uh, again, you could probably do a wider search on that. Also, you see the fuzzy hash, which is the SSD, which is pointed to by item 3. What's interesting about fuzzy hashing is, is that when we think in terms of, um, again, trying to identify malcode, our regular hashing algorithms are really focused on um, exactness, right? The integrity is as we expect because these hashes match. The problem with that is, is that when people write malcode, they usually put... Sometimes the malcode itself may be self-modifying, which is going to change its hash. Uh, could be that the author changes it just a little bit for each, each use of the malcode. But with fuzzy hash, what that puts on the table is, is that when we go to a lot of our major malware engines, or if we just use SSD by a large line of potential malicious files we have, we could say something like, well, show me all the malware that's within certain percentage of matching this. So we could say everything within 80%. And then all of a sudden your volume of malcode, which again may relate to this for specific samples, grows tremendously. And what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, when we think in terms, we may have a sample right now that is incredibly up-armored from its original code. However, when we search with like SSD, we may find a version where our intruder accidentally left the symbols. It didn't remove the symbols when you compile the malcode. And that's to your advantage. Um, so moving along. Um, so when we look at, uh, again, down at the bottom, we'll get a little bit of history and we get when the malcode was first submitted as well as when it was last analyzed and last submitted. And the reason why that's interesting to you is that when it pops up for you, maybe you found it this year, but it was first submitted back in 2017. It's connected to a rushing hacking group. Just found it. 
as an analyst, that's an exciting moment. You probably need to talk about things from a time perspective. How long has the adversary been operating in the network environment, right? This brings up some other questions. So this information is really, really useful. Again, your primary role is reversing. You probably want to bring this to the attention of the analyst, maybe the business intrusion analysis or response or something else and say, hey, it seems like this has been out there for a while. You just now found it. What's been going on? Whoops, so maybe you forgot to clean up. Maybe uh, they were using this particular uh, backdoor, you know, maintain it. That is even uh, what the sample is about. It is the backdoor. Okay, moving along. Um, so now we're back to the studio. And again, uh, we're just taking a closer look at the imports themselves. Uh, and so, kind of speaking, uh, what's going on in the slide, one points to what the primary library is that's being imported. Uh, that again allows us access to API calls. Uh, shows you which one of those API calls, specifically the functions, is actually blacklisted. And four and five point to the actual functions from those libraries that are being called. What's interesting is the ones that are blacklisted, uh, virtual protect, uh, get uh, over, I can't even read it at this point, um, exit process. Uh, you know, th those are interesting because typically virtual protect means you're going to tinker with memory permissions somewhere, right? Usually a good indication that you might be dealing with algos is virtual protection. Good code, but it's interesting to find it. Exit process it could be anti-analysis conditions. So if you are thinking about, um, again, doing uh, dynamic code analysis, you may find that the sample just will not be done for you. And so, uh, again, when we get to some of those later stages, you may want to set breakpoints there and go, well, what conditions, and then analyze backwards, or what conditions will cause us to go down this path. Um, again, now we're into the sections area, and this is just where, again, we've read the metadata, we said, hey, where's all your stuff at? Now we go to where the stuff's at. Again, we see the UTX 0, 1, 2, and then bonus, we can see uh, here I'm pointing to the hashes. I probably should have been pointing to uh, you know, the entry on here. Um, as well as the permissions on the bottom, you can see the red X's. That means that's kind of a, um, a problem based on the permissions that are set for that individual section. Um, there's typically uh, uh, when you are just making right, compiling regular code, typically there's a standard set of permissions that are in play. And so, again, this may give you more indication to the analyst on this stuff. Um, I just can't beat it to death enough, though. Again, if you have sections named, yeah, it's like when it's that consistent, you're missing the standard sections like octets and things like that. You probably just need to on that and see what you come up with. Moving along, though, um, we invoke another tool because let's say we've never heard of uh, UPX in, I don't know, we just can't use Google. Um, this is another tool that will quickly look at a portable executable, do some quick analysis, and maybe tell you how to uh, depress it, code it, uh, decrypt it um, with, without having to execute. And here it shows down the bottom where I have it. One, it tells you where to go to go get the UPX uh, tool so you can hit, uh, again, and get this back to something that is readable. I do want to say for um, some versions of Malcode, people have taken the UPX Packer and have modified it just slightly where you can't get the off the shelf to the office game. However, for our Russians, it's not what they chose to do. So, with UPX, we put a dash G switch. That's what's in the highlighted area. It's the sample, that ridiculously long um, string of uh, hex values, underscore Golang. Is my sample uh, again? Again, that's fine. Code I'm able to use, and I just put an underscore building at the end of it. So I just again I run run this particular binary the dash D against my file, and out pops uh, again what I believe is an unpacked file, uh, which can be see the status where it says unpacked file. Moving along. So now we run it back through our tool. What do we get? I'm back on the section area. Again, back here, we saw UPX was the name of all of our sections after we run UPX decoder. Hello, that looks more like a regular portable executable. Now we're on to something, right? Now we've deobfuscated the file, and we should probably take a closer look at what's inside this file. Um, just point at some sections that are of interest. Again, doc text is typically where the code is. Uh, and then dot R data. Um, again, that area probably shouldn't be executable. There's probably something interesting there. Uh, again, from the analyst point of view, uh, you know, with a simple hex editor, we can just jump to these sections because we have the start and ending of each one of those sections. So lots of ways to approach this. 
Again, going back up to the beginning, uh, we rerun, uh, you know, we're using PD Studio. We might as well jump back to the beginning again. We get a lot of indications here. I'm going to speed up a little bit just because uh, I'm doing quite a bit of talking. Uh, but, but the point is, is um, let's say you had a sample that was encrypted. Um, you know, there's some kind of anti-analysis uh, uh, technique in play. So you get that out of the way, and now you have the raw file itself where it's unprotected. Always run it back through these tools because you may end up with different results. That's all I was trying to get to here. I'm bore you by telling you what's in those sections again. Again, now we have more vendors like, oh, now it's instead of 25 vendors, now 52 out of 72 vendors go, oh, this is uh, Zabrowski or however you say it, along. Um, here, what I wanted to show is, uh, and this is kind of uh, what's interesting about getting into malware analysis. Sometimes you'll have tools that absolutely fail on impact. What I mean by impact is the moment that you try to use them. And for whatever reason, PE Studio was not able to parse out the names of different API calls. And so what I chose to play, I took the free version of IDA Pro. IDA Pro does a pretty good job of parsing out libraries, functions, things like that. And I just pulled the file in there. And what do you know? Even though my studio would not show that to me with the deobfuscated file, um, IDA Pro had no problem. And again, now I get a lot more hints as far as what the capabilities are of this malware based on your selection of API calls. Moving along. Um, so back to PE Studio, we're not done yet. Um, we go straight to the strings section. What's interesting about using strings within uh, PE Studio is that, again, they already have a blacklist of things. So they're already highlighting for you certain strings that you might be interested in. Okay. Um, this is something for you to take note in. Uh, we can see, again, here's the term post. Uh, what are we posting to? There's some kind of a web communication associated with this. Uh, also, as we look further in the strings, we may find other indicators that are interesting for us. Um, as I go further down into the strings, what are we greeted with? really doing much work. It's all the imports from Golang. So not only do we have the Windows API calls, we also have all the namespaces, uh, all the namespaces from Golang that are in play for this particular malware. Again, we haven't done anything yet. You can imagine everything I just showed you that I spent all this time boo, 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 doing all this explaining, right? This we just did within a minute. You're just dragging, dropping, you know. Yeah, that's go lang. What's it doing go lang? Well, we kind of read through, right? HTTP capability, go oh, funny, that kind of matches the post we saw we saw earlier. Uh, we can see the references to the .go file extension that's associated with go lang. Uh, language, um, you know, the, the point is, uh, you know. Oh, you're going to play for me. So Russian malware. Majestic, no more. She killed the eagle. Thank you. All right, moving along. So we just broke some much Russian malware. I got to tell you, the distance between here and figuring out what, what the Russians were up to is uh, very short. Okay, so we're moving on. All right, now we're going to reverse engineer some Python-based malware. Um, again, uh, I didn't populate the other sections. I decided maybe um, we don't need to do power talk for twelve hours. As I go through all the you might do. So we're sticking static analysis for this particular section, and uh, again, I'm going to stay a little on the interwebs and really can't write this down, but I do list out all the tools that are in play here. You'll notice one theme here is, is that um, the tools don't matter, it's what you're after, okay? That's why I switch up the tools that are in play, okay? You'll find, if you really think about what I'm showing you today, all these tools have tremendous overlap. Um, and, and in the last uh, sample that we looked at, sometimes our tools fail. And that's why we need eight different tools at the same job. Uh, because then what you're left with is your own graphics, code, interpret, sometimes that can think about how much time that costs. Right now it starts costing more time when we have to do custom things. But that's why we also argue that, uh, again, as we go further and further down the methodology, it does require more skill because then we have to. Uh, have more knowledge. You know, I can show this to any analyst in the street, and they're going to have tremendous gains right out of the gate. But when every tool fails, what then? Different skills you got to bring there. And that takes more time to acquire some of those skills. So, moving along. Um, so, here we go. Um, I think I'm using 3 um, And uh, we should have a little 
pointer here, um, but, but if you look uh, at the very uh, top of the screenshot, there's uh, the word desktop, kind of to the right of the dollar sign where it says desktop, I'm calling the binary read and read. That's all I have to do. And then I tell it what file it is that I want to use the binary read and read against. And what's interesting here is just, you know, again, I'm showing you a different view that's reading all this information that is standard uh, for a portable executable when you create one. What we end up finding in here is, for instance, the execution environment. And just unfortunately, uh, I don't have my Zoom here, uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you what's up there as an example. If we go down to, there's a kind of uh, some white space, uh, and then we get down to the cough file header. Okay, and what's there is, is I386. So again, we're dealing with, you know, 32-bit code, which in my opinion gives us a better sense of doing disassembly, how it is to disassemble. Um, I can tell you as an example, like let's say you're dealing with a boot kit, right? We're, we're dealing with a boot kit and we're looking at, for instance, the master boot record on the disk. If you want to analyze that code, that's 16-bit code. So it really helps to know uh, what CPU, if you will, that the code was specifically compiled for. There's also other information here that tells you things like characteristics of the file, um, like this one, uh, you know, it's large address aware, um, and again, it is an executable, it's not a library. Uh, we also see references to how big each one of the sections are, uh, again, in our PP Studio, and that's more towards the bottom of PP Studio. We had a separate section in the GUI tool that we would click on. And then it would break out all the sections and things like that. Well, here it's telling you where all the sections start, how big they are, and things like that. Um, again, I'm still just looking at the same tool. Uh, we're just looking at characteristics of it. We can see from a DLL perspective for uh, fun reason. We can see that dynamic base is enabled. You might disable that when you're doing analysis. Uh, that could make your work a little bit easier. Uh, we can also see other things like where's the entry point for the code. Again, that's really helpful later when we're doing um, analysis further down the road because, uh, for instance, if we're debugging, we probably want to set breakpoints uh, on the entry point as an example. So when the system does finally load the file into memory, it's not actually running. Now we're in control of that file. Lots of good information here. Let's definitely connect on what it is. But the tool I'm using is ReadDB. Again, it's just reading all the stuff that is guaranteed with a portable executable for file format. Say that again. Read. 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 So and it's part of the Rumnux toolkit. Um, so again, uh, Rumnux, REM, MUX, um, freely available. It is packed inside there. And there's a lot of great tutorials on there. So if you're dealing with this file type, there's these 10 tools for stack analysis. That's how helpful that uh, is for what it is and contents around it. Um, again, here we're using PE Scanner. I think we're. Oh, no, my, my apologies, I'm still in the PE. Uh, and what PE is showing us again, or what API calls are involved, you can see that uh, from user32.dll, we're only using message box A. Kind of interesting uh, what's going on with that message box. And of course, we can see the API calls from kernel 32. The thing that readme does not do for us, and it requires a little more expert knowledge, is it doesn't tell you what's interesting, right? It doesn't tell you, like, PE Studio was highlighting it. It's like, hey, this one blacklisted. Oh, I should care about that one. You're not getting that here. You're just getting the raw content, what's being important, what the API calls are. So, again, to move forward, uh, you know, I use another tool, uh, PE Scan. PE Scan's fun. Just kind of right out the gate, it tells you, you know, what the entropy is. The tool that we just use, read PE, did not tell us entropy. So, again, using this other tool, PE Scan, we get that result, as well as some other indications that are typically associated with mount code. Um, the reason why we do this is we're trying to get similar results as what we got that were all packed all in one in the PE Studio, but now we've had to invoke two tools to kind of get a similar result to go, hmm, maybe there's something interesting here. Moving along, uh, again, this is uh, Now here we're actually using PE Scanner. Now what's cool about PE Scanner is that it reads from the entry point and it gives us a lot of that metadata that we might use to our open searches within Google or within our malware repositories, okay? And what it shows here is it actually goes to that first entry point and looks at what's there. Typically, what you don't see with legitimate software is an immediate function call or an immediate jump, okay? In the um, assembly and 
construction. And what's on the screen, and, and again, it may be a little bit tough from your point of view, but I can make it available after the presentation, uh, is that, the, again, the very first instruction from the entry point is to go into some other function and then jump somewhere else. And so that's, that's a little bit interesting. And then uh, some of the other um, uh, points that we get, we also get our uh, imp hash, your fuzzy hash. And again, I described the advantages of those earlier. We can go out to your malware repos, maybe find similar samples. Let's say this one didn't have any symbols with it. Maybe we'll find where our adversary accidentally compiled a version of this. Like there's uh, symbols out in the open. And that's real helpful with C, C++ malcode. Now, this one turns out to be Python. That's what we already know, as I told you in the beginning. So we keep on analyzing. Again, from the same tool, we also get a virus scan result, but it's using Clam AP. Apparently, Clam AP thinks it's a Trojan. That's kind of interesting. Maybe you should care if it tells you that. We also get the entropy by section. Uh, the reason why that might be interesting to you is depending on what that section is. Again, that may be an indication that there's some, uh, something interesting packed in there. Uh, we also get what the API calls are. What's interesting here is, is that we get an additional API call. Right? We get an additional library that wasn't identified by our other tools earlier, which is what's pointed to by item 3. So, as we move forward, we also get, from this tool, scanner, we actually get a works on specific function calls that are typically uh, associated with malware. And so, again, we have a tool that's trying to empower us to help speed up the process, should we care about this file, and again, give us things that, you know, now we can start searching on, well, what do these function calls do? What does that mean for me to see that? And why is my tool telling me, hey, alert, alert, you should probably hear that these exist in your sample. Um, here I'm running uh, floss. Now, earlier I showed uh, going into the studio, we went to the string section, the string section had blacklist of strings, and you sort on that. Okay, floss again is just a command line tool, it's made by FireEye, and it just pulls out all the ASCII and Unicode strings. And what we end up finding that's interesting when we lost our sample uh, is we actually end up finding some references like archive not found. Error message. We also find PYI dash Windows dash manifest dash file name. What is that? That seems really relevant, right? Like you're looking through, you know, got all this gobbledygook, right? That means nothing. And all of a sudden you have this plain English about something PYI. Well, if you do a quick search on that, you can see that you're dealing with compiled Python. Now we have our first big indication as an analyst that, hey, I'm looking um, and then again, three, uh, failed to get address for ey underscore verbose flan. That's what number three points to. Uh, again, it's interesting that uh, specific uh, error message is something you can also search on within Google. There's so many references to ey underscore this and that. But again, these are just indicators for you as an analyst to get down to you know, what's, what really is this. Uh, moving along. Uh, Again, so we run a tool. Oh, I hate that I covered it up. Uh, clearly, I'm running from Nux. Um, but the name of the tool is PE underscore EXE underscore unpack. Okay? And all that does is when you, uh, uh, again, uh, compile your Python code, become an executable, this is another tool that will bring it back to byte code. Okay? How, so you get the byte code file, which is a file of the extension .uyc. Interesting. But the problem with the tool is, and uh, uh, I, unfortunately I'm not the one who makes it, I, I don't understand why this was left out, is typically when you have a Python bytecode, normally there's a header at the front of the file that tells Python that, hey, this is bytecode. So you do have to manually repair that header. The cool thing is if you have Python on your system, you can just go find any other PYC file and copy those first few uh, byte values. And then here I'm just using uh, WX hex editor and Remnox, and I just go in and I just, I just type in what those values should be at the beginning of the file. So it's really important for our next tool uh, that we end up running um, called Uncompile uh, 6. And Uncompile 6 takes us back to source code. Uh, and I don't know if you guys want to lean in to see this, but that is the Python source code for this. We are back to source code, folks. Okay. So. Does the header change based on the version of Python you have? Or is it always, like if you're running 2.7 or 3, or some version of 3, like minor version? 
that's a good question. Um, I imagine it could change, but it hasn't affected anything I'm doing at this point. And you could probably just, you know, like get install Python 2 and 3 on a system and go look at the EYC files and see if there is a difference in the header. That would be my fast way to get there. Um, file. 
Uh, and this uh, part of the file is showing resources. And what I find that's interesting within a hex viewer is that we can see things like who makes this, a version number. And I'm going to jump to a screen where this is a lot easier to see. Okay, I'm going to use a tool that makes it easier to see. But I'm just saying in a hex editor, the next tool I show you, you can see this information. And what's in there is, it's literally a reference to the name NJRAP. And then you get a version, dot, or seven, dot, zero dot seven. That's like, that's really specific stuff. You should probably just see what it is you find. Uh, also, when we get to the end, um, in the resource section, we also find some other references that kind of give it away that this is, uh, if you search in some of the strings, you'll end up seeing that this is .NET related. And uh, because it's .NET related, that does give you some clues as an analyst. What other tools you might go later, you have to get further in the analysis chain. But I'm making the case today that we don't have to leave static analysis, really, any of these tools to get stuff that's going to be meaningful for us to respond and get meaningful content back to people who are dependent on us. Uh, this next section just shows, I'm just doing strings, guys. That's all this is. And as I'm going through the strings, I see a string with the name Confuser. If you go search on that, again, you get uh, to GitHub. And the GitHub tells you that it's a dot, uh, a dot .NET uh, uh, hacker slash anti-analysis slash. It has a whole bunch of features to make it hard for someone to get back to your source code. Because the thing with dot .NET is you file dot .NET. And when you take it, you get right back to source code. So Confuser makes it hard for off-the-shelf tools to do that. But with that being said, we have another clue, right? We have the NJ rap reference. We have the version number, oddly enough. We have this reference to Confuser. We know it's not net related. So finding these things. Oh, and then by the way, we have the reference to the .NET library that ms4.dll. Probably some kind of .NET code that's in there packed. Uh, so here it is. So we type in NJ rap source. C, you know, sharp, uh, NJ rap, Confuser X. What do we get? We get videos on how to go through and break this down and so on and so forth. This is a really important step, and I know you guys, uh, maybe it's feeling like, hey, this is really benign. It's really important when it comes to analysis because if you're tasked with doing this kind of work, again, it could be, uh, could be actually in the middle of an incident. Um, it could be in a job where you're expected to do this for thousands of samples. But the point is, is that you do not need to be in the business of recreating the real. Okay? You're just trying to get the answers. And literally the answers we have is, is the source code for this for ready.lead. And if you had it in your heart where you want to deal with a specific variant that's in your control, there's also videos where people are showing you how you can bypass this tool called Confuser X, which is used with a lot of outcode samples written on that. Uh, these are all the samples. If you want to go back and recreate my work, again, I'm going to make this available on the public interwebs. I'll post it in the Discord. Um, you can definitely go back and recreate my steps. Uh, and again, uh, the words in orange, that's the name of the malware that we looked at today. Definitely do a Google search on those. You'll see that we've broken everything from primeware to governmentware today. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah. All right. Step away. Any any questions while I have this up? All right. Now, just from like a regulatory standpoint, yeah. uh, let's say you're in a financial industry such as um, pieces, for instance. Uh, at what point do you have to report this stuff to the government? Malware. Yeah. Oh, there's an obligation for any industry to report malware to the government. Um, okay. But let, let's talk about being. Uh, look, we all live in the United States at this point. Okay. I think if, if you're being a good citizen. Thank you. 
for Bard. For Bard has a malware sandbox that's available to its members. There is no cost for participation in, uh, in for Bard. Totally recommend if you're a U.S. citizen going up. If you're not a citizen, please become citizens. You can join in for Bard. Uh, as in for Bard, um, uh, again, when you submit the samples there, you've now effectively made it available to law enforcement. Uh, hopefully it helps a little bit with your question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Just I'm up here with the slide deck. Over. 